win. Very cool. That's awesome. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Bat. It's recording. Sound check sounds good. So, B size indie, pretty badass, huh? Did you guys have a great time or what? A lot of fun. A lot of fun. We had a great time. So, today's talk is uh, kind of had the theme of last year. There was an election. Somebody had a certain. Um, campaign slogan, so we kind of took it from this. And this talk originally was created with Chris Sistrunk and myself. So there's still going to be references to Chris, but um, I'm, you know, well, he'll be here in memory, and you know, like an imaginary Chris will be here, but I'll be playing him. So uh, first quick introduction, you guys know me as Dave Heel Schwartzberg. Uh, there's my Twitter handle. I work for Mobile Iron and uh, work in mobile security but also help create Hack for Kids back in 2014. And there's going to be some additional references to that. But everybody who's uh, you know, running on a campaign needs to have a slogan. So mine is, no child's email is left behind. They should all have their own server. <laughs> so now I'll be acting in the part of Chris. Uh, Chris is drunk. He's a consultant, uh, big skater guy, ICS, over at FireEye, formerly Mandiant, uh, and also one of the organizer or the organizer for B-Sides Jackson. And uh, his slogan is, we're going to build a firewall. I'm going to make IT pay for it. Make Skater great again. Try to do my best, Chris, there. So in the spirit of us all being patriotic, technical, and security people, please chant with me. USB, USB, USB. Thank you for your participation. So now, why don't we just kind of cut over to STEM. So um, anybody here never hear, uh, heard of STEM before, knowing it is science, technology, engineering, and math? We've all heard of it. Good. Little background most people don't know. It was uh, started back in 1997 by the National Science Foundation, and there was uh, a committee who voted that this is what they want to do to help educators be more collaborative on what they're teaching uh, U.S. You know, students, early childhood, middle school, uh, college, because we were falling behind internationally uh, when it came to these disciplines. About 13 years later, a group of people came together and said, you know, we're missing something, art. So they created a website, STEAM, not STEM. And art's important. It absolutely is. Creativity is kind of like a foundation of what we do and, you know, as, as humans. About four years later, uh, Rob Furman from the Huffington Post wrote an article on, uh, you know, we need to include reading, which creates the acronym of STREAM, which is very interesting. But reading is also important. You know, all these disciplines are very important. I'm not saying one is more important than the other, but I'm really here to focus on STEM. So is Barack Obama. So back in 2010, Barama want, uh, Barama, Barack Obama, or Obama, wanted to expand what we're doing with education so that way there would be uh, $250 million available to train educators and enable them to train future students, which is great. So when you have like, all these funds available, you could start to really do things. Because we all know, even when we want to do our science projects, when we want to hack harder or just kind of learn how to code, there is a cost. You know, there's a cost to get on the internet. There's a cost for equipment. It's not free. I'm going to read this one part that's bolded. So I think this is really kind of, um, really represents and reflects what a lot of the people in this room kind of think and, and feel. So, uh, paraphrasing, science, it is an approach to the world, a critical way to understand and explore and engage with the world, and then leave the capacity to change that world. Hmm, what does that sound like? All right, we'll get to that in a bit. But very, very important. So how do we come up with this? So we, we hang out and hang out, and... Chris and I were just kind of talking about how we, we need to include hacking a lot more in some of the things that youths are doing. 
Uh, we believe that they're natural hackers for a variety of reasons. And uh, so we wanted to kind of come up with an acronym. And we came up with uh, maybe putting the H after the S, put S-H-T-M, your E-M didn't seem like, you could, yeah, you could, you could put another vowel in there. And we didn't think that would be appropriate. So then we thought, well, M-E-T-H-S um, wouldn't also be a good choice. But so we came up with the H before the M. And now this is tricky. Is the H silent? Is it not? How do you say that, right? Is it, is it stem with a long H? And that sounds kind of creepy. Or are you clearing your throat? Stem. <clears throat> Excuse me. What do we want people to say? Yeah, stem with an H. Yeah. So we just pronounce stem. Or if you choose one of the other ones that you like, feel free. But we just decided that that seems to work the easiest for everybody. So what are you talking about, this stem? This was one of Chris's slides. He, he likes doing impersonations. So you know, we're going to present to you very quickly science, technology, engineering, and hacking and math. I think you guys saw that coming. But really, it's, it's arguable. Uh, I've heard some arguments saying, well, you, know, you got all these other STEM disciplines, and, and hacking is different. It's not exactly the same approach as what you're doing with science, technology, engineering, and math. So it really doesn't belong. I mean, does anybody agree or disagree? I mean, we can be controversial about it. Right, maybe. But when you look at just, for example, science and math, what are they? Methodologies to solve problems, very simplistically, right? Methodologies to solve problems. And if you keep using those methodologies, hopefully you'll continue to solve some problems. Some of them might be more difficult than others. But when you look at technology and engineering, is that the same as science and math? No, it's applications of science and math. And what's hacking? Applications of STEM. Make sense? So what you're doing as a, as a hacker, you have a process, you have a methodology. Sometimes you're making that up as you go along. But you're using that methodology to expand what you know about those other four disciplines. Make sense? Agree? Disagree? I'm open for comment. Okay. It's a nice response. Thank you for being kind. But if we want to talk, if you seriously want to talk about that later, absolutely open for discussion. Because I don't want to stand behind something that I believe in. Chris feels the same way and strongly about. And if we're wrong, or if there's a way that we can make it righter, then I'd like to do that. And that well, in the words of uh, Russell Ackoff, the famous economist, doing things righter. So quick overview of why we think this is important. First, we're going to have some reasons on why to include the H or hacking in STEM. There's a lot of hacking education going on. If, if anybody's like an old school hacker can think back to when they were dialing up to a BBS, it's kind of tough to get into a crew, right? It was very different. A lot of this information was coveted. You couldn't just get it as freely as you can now. Got some case studies, and I want to talk about some challenges you know, going forward. So who here was like a technology hobbyist that turned this hobby into a career? Just a lot of you, some of you still unsure? Right, the majority of the room, no different. I can go back to my TRS-80 Model 3, which I still have in my garage, or, or my, uh, my Apple IIe knockoff called the Laser 128, which broke the moment I opened it up. So, say la vie. But we, we started putzing around with the different equipment software, hardware, what have you. We would try to find some of that secret knowledge and things like the, the, you know, the special cookbook that's out there. Or you can see like on the far right, you know, kids, hackers, breaking things, breaking into banks, those damn hackers. Those kids are all the same, they're a problem. Gotta get rid of them, right? And then there's also some of the ones that became professionals, right? Kevin Mandiant, right, Mandia, from Mandiant, now um, over there at FireEye, so big Uncle Kevin. And then uh, Uncle Dave, like who doesn't love Uncle Dave? Great guy, great contributor to the community, another person who went from you know, a hobby to a profession, and people like giving back to the community. So this is kind of a lot of us, right? But also the media has their say in things. If you can read that headline on the far left, if you can't, 
Hackers can turn your home computer into a bomb and blow your family to smithereens. It's hard to say that without wanting to laugh. Um, who here has done that other than maybe CP? <laughs> right? Ridiculous. Or whenever there's a breach, those damn hackers! The media loves this because it's, it's like almost fictitious news sometimes, right? They don't check all their facts and we just kind of keep banging our head against the desk saying, check your facts, get it right, and we're all not bad. I don't know if there's any bad people in this room. There might be. You're doing a good job covering it up. But we're really here to kind of promote things like innovation, right? Education, community. And then we got Mr. Robot. Who has not seen Mr. Robot? It's OK. A couple people. Why is it so popular? Because it's not like the movie The Net. It's actually something where they're using real tools, and it's a very honest portrayal of some of the the hacker culture, right? Not 100% completely accurate, but it's also the consultants, professional hackers. So they're really kind of going to the source in order to communicate publicly kind of some of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis or just enjoy doing once in a while. What was that? Better than Scorpion. Better than Scorpion. <laughs> you talked about consultants from Mr. Robot. We're, well, we have one on staff. We have one. So there is somebody. He's a Michigan gentleman, um, James Plough. He, he <clears throat> one of the people that was producing, and I'm, I might get the story a little wrong, but from what he, I remember him telling me that he had an intern that he worked with. The intern, and he was teaching him infosec. The intern decided, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go to Hollywood and I'm going to help produce movies. They ran into each other in an airport and said, Hey, we're putting this kind of cyber tech show movie together, do you want to be a consultant? And it's kind of like when you run into a friend, it's very passing. You're like, yeah, sure, give me a call. We exchange contact information. And James really was like, yeah, nothing's probably going to come out of that. But a month later, uh, the gentleman contacted James. And his first year working as a tech consultant, just simple stuff like verifying that the use of certain technical terms are being used properly, coming up with some kind of creative hacks that kind of inter or integrate into the show. And um, his first year, though, you kind of think, wow, this is really cool. Well, it was a startup, so they paid him with a T-shirt or sweatshirt, just kind of like yours, but it says Mr. Robot. It's pretty cool. But now the show's taking off, and things are good. He still works at Mobile Iron, But I wasn't going to bring that up, but since you did, it's all good. Yeah, and James is so cool. He's a great guy. So, um, so we have the media, but there's also a workforce shortage, right? You know, a part of being able to work or be, you know, be a part of the skilled labor force, you need education. You could start as a hobbyist. You could go to school. You can learn. I remember going to school. This stuff wasn't there. In college, it was only learning how to become a developer. There was no networking courses. There was no cybersecurity. And now we have that, at least in universities and somewhat in high schools, but lower level, it really depends on the budgets and, and the available funds within that district in order for them to teach, say, elementary or, mil uh, or middle school kids any of these kinds of fun skills, or even to kind of mess around with a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. But um, CSO is seeing that there's going to be uh, about, I think it's the year 2020, 1 million open InfoSec positions. I think that's a global number. I don't think that's just the US. But that's a lot. That's not far away. How are these people going to get trained? We can't keep working as hard and fast as we do. We need to start to bring in some new people and train them. And at B-Sides Las Vegas last year, Swag was walking around interviewing some folks. And, and they're asking different practitioners of, like, what's a good way to approach this problem? And some people just, I don't have any idea. And it's a hard problem to solve, educating the next workforce getting those million people employed. And so, uh, so that's a bitly to the video if you want to watch it. So when we go to education, we, you know, we, look at, we look at kids. It's actually kind of playing the long game. You know, there are people today that we can train, but if we start with some kids and those people that we can train today, it'll be a lot easier path. Don't we want to have like a, a smoother road to drive on rather than the less bumpy one that we keep hitting potholes with? So why kids? Well, first of all, they're very curious. 
Have you ever had a, a kid ask you a question and you give them an answer and what's the first thing they say after that? Why? 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 And it's incessant, but you know, as an adult, you kind of get it and you take for granted that you get it, but for them, the world is new and they're very eager to explore it. So, you know, it's a part of our responsibility to kind of get them through all those whys. I love the next one. They question authority. Uh, my kids love to question authority. In case I didn't tell you, I got, I got three boys, uh, ages 11, 9, and 5. And, and even the five-year-old, you know, he, he stands up for himself, which he should. But when we're like, hey, it's time to, you know, take a shower and go to bed, nah, I'm going to watch YouTube videos. Maybe that's not the best way to question authority. But don't we do that today? Don't we look at whatever the government or some entity is doing and saying, you know, that's not probably the best way to do it for reasons of caring about people or just human rights. But we should continue doing that. We should never stop questioning authority, and neither should kids. But they should respect authority, and so should we. And they're darn persistent. Again, back to the, the why. But even when they're stuck trying to solve a problem, you ever see a kid trying to put a square peg in a round hole? They're not going to stop until they get pretty darn close, or you give them a cookie. Um, sometimes a cookie is the best way to go. But the persistence is also very important. Aren't we very much the same way? Right? How about their ability to innovate? Excuse me, i got a great example of that coming up. But if you give them something, we saw that today at, at the table in the next room. Gave some kids some electronics. Yeah, one of them picked his head up. And they just went and just started plugging things in, doing some stuff that none of us probably thought of before. And that's great. We want them to do that. Innovation is so important when it's done properly. But if we don't have people properly trained on what security principles and practices are, and when they do create new technology, <coughs> IoT, they have to have those security practices in there. And if they're not doing it from the design, what do we have? <coughs> IoT, excuse me. Um, and they're also great social engineers. Have you ever um, had a kid say, well, I'll give you my example. So I'll have my son come up and say, well, um, I want to go to a movie tonight, and I'm going to go with my friends, and, and you know, his mom will be there. All right, what would your mom say? All right, I'll be right back. She said to ask you. I said, okay. Um, well, and we go through the questions. Is your homework done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, his, his incentive is to go to the movie. So what do you think he's going to tell me? Everything I want to hear. Yeah, homework's done. Well, they're always going to use that ability, <clears throat> excuse me, to tell us what we want to know, tell us what we need to hear to get to the next level. Are we any different as professionals? I'd say not. I mean, doesn't mean you have to be a liar, but what's a good social engineer? A liar that's not caught. So, so my kids have learned to be good social engineers. Um, this is a great story. This is a really good story. I mean, aside from like starting this stuff at third grade, this one young, uh, this five-year-old boy, while his dad was at work, wanted to use the Xbox. His dad works in IT, so of course, wants to have some tech laying around, and his kid, well, also his dad put a passcode on the Xbox, so his kid can't just use it any time of day. Which makes sense. So what does the kid do? He uses his curiosity of punching extra codes and is persistent to not stopping until he performs a buffer overflow on the Xbox with the controller and gets right in. It's a great story. Find the video. And the interview kind of went like this. I wanted to play video games, so I kept pushing codes until I got in. Yay! <laughs> so cute. Love it. Oh. One, four, nine, two. Okay. And one, four, nine, two. Is it okay to share your password with people? Yeah. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Yeah. You guys heard that, right? Is it okay to share your passwords? How many of you guys have users like that? They think it's okay to share their passwords. Um, or you can call them customers. But that's little Benny a couple years ago. Really didn't 
speak very much for many years, but whenever he went to go and unlock the tablet, he would always say the passcode out loud. You know, his incentive is to get in there, but just it took about a year to teach him to say it inside his head. And then finally we got him to change the passcode. So now only Benny and I know the passcode, and it was really cute, and he's like, Mommy, I'm not allowed to tell you the passcode. We had a conversation after that. <laughs> um, here's another really great story. So kind of back to Benny, though. You know, we, we do have people that don't put passcodes on their devices. They may have you know, like company email. They may have something on there, like some files, that maybe they do some like insurance inspections, and they went out to the field and took pictures of um, some really bad scenes. And this all should be really kept private. But their device could be easily broken into if it's an older version of Android. Um, I think we also have somebody in an elected position that's using an older Android phone and does a lot of tweeting, which could be a problem. So here's another great story. So this is a story about Chris Sistrunk's son who was learning how to use MIT Scratch. You guys know how to use Scratch? It's fun, even for adults. Simple way, it's kind of like Legos with some coding syntax. You don't have to be caught up on doing all the typing, but things snap together very nicely, and if they don't belong together, it just gives you a nice, pleasant beeping sound. So Chris's son had this Pong game that he made. But, you know, with his, his curiosity and innovative skills, he said, you know, every time player one or player two hits the ball, I want to make some random colors. I want to make it all psychedelic. I want the ball to go nuts. I think he even had some sounds that were going in there and getting louder and louder, driving Chris's poor wife insane slowly. The next thing was, he said, well, I want to win. So I'm going to change the rules. Every time I hit the ball, my paddle's going to grow 10 points in size. And every time player two hits the paddle or hits the ball, their paddle's going to shrink, making it harder and harder. But then he actually said, well, let's make the ball bigger, where it just kind of went back and forth making noise and just kind of stopped moving, and it was just this big psychedelic blob on the computer. Kind of cool. That's, that's the innovation and curiosity. But being the nine-year-old that he is, what do you guys think he named his awesome Scratch program? <laughs> look at this. Look at the screen. <laughs> yeah, you all laugh, but are we any different? <laughs> so why should we include hacking in education, right? I mean, you can kind of see it. Some of the kids who are able to have these resources available, they're really able to kind of explore and innovate and question authority and be social engineers and all that other good stuff. And there's an increasing number of organizations doing this, and this list is even just a very short list. Uh, my first introduction to something like this was uh, DEF CON Kids, which later became Roots Asylum, which part of that kind of inspired me to create Hack for Kids in addition to a lot of other reasons, kind of at least make, make a community of kids that are have you know, these, these similar interests and be able to share ideas and, and work together on stuff. And if you saw them earlier at the Snap Circuit table, they were having a great time putting bar batteries in series to give a propeller more power and kept shooting it into the ceiling. But that's, that's creativity and innovation. Um, it's pointless, but it's very creative. The other thing was um, there's cyber boot camps, there's interrupt, but there's also like hack day camp, which is international. So there's one in uh, San Jose and then a couple other countries where um, you know people can go and bring their kids and have the, uh, their, their kid hack day. And then there's also uh, the cyber patriot. Who's heard of cyber patriot? Big up, and, yeah, it's good stuff, right? It's um, it helps teach middle schoolers and high school students and even military academy students about red teaming and blue teaming and also has competitions and it's backed by the US Air Force. It's a great program. Uh, they're also trying to get into like uh, elementary school, which I think would be really challenging. Uh, I personally tried to create a Cyber Patriot team and if you're thinking of doing one, the idea really is um, to start to do it you, you got to get the parents behind you. Reaching out to the district president, reaching out to the principals, or any, even the IT teacher. I tried all those different avenues and really didn't get very far. Of course, you know, yeah, yeah, this sounds great. We want to do it, but we don't have the funds. No, I'll, I'll take care of it. Set up virtual machines. I'll teach it. We just need to make sure there's an educator in the room from the, from the school. Yeah, okay, and nothing happens. Get the teachers behind you. Sorry, get the 
parents behind you, and then that will help get teachers to rally with them to bring a cyber patriot to your school or your kid's school. Uh, cool program, very cool. Quick case study, uh, so you guys know about Hack for Kids, right? Anybody who doesn't, so I can maybe, real briefly, Hack for Kids is a charity designed uh, to help solve some of these problems where kids that are curious about technology, uh, cybersecurity, uh, or, or anything that has to do with tech, we're there to introduce some of these things to them as well as make friends, but also teach them about anti-cyber bullying and, and safety online. So it's, it's, we do a lot. We also have a first Lego League team. Uh, we also have done some other stuff, which I'll talk about in a bit. So that's Hack for Kids. So here's a couple of case studies. So these are, these are really, really good stories. Um, and this is part of the, like, well, this, we do this for a lot of reasons, but you know, this is kind of like when we hear these stories, it, it, it makes you feel like, yes, we're really making progress. And, and I don't want to say this is exactly the reason why we do it, but sometimes you know, it feels like that. So uh, there's Bob. Bob was 14 when we met him at Circle CityCon about two years ago. And Bob came to the room that we were in. We did a village kind of similar to what we did today with B-Sides Indy. And uh, Bob never, ever knew anything about crypto. Yeah, he knows what the padlock in his browser is supposed to do, but nothing like you know what we did today in the CTF. Completely foreign. So he sat down at the table and was like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. That's great. Very open-minded. Bob spent the rest of his day there. We had about eight or nine challenges, anything from base 64, um, monoalphabetic substitution ciphers, uh, just converting um, a binary, like really, really simple things that you can automate with a tool, but Bob did it by hand. And even when we went to lunch and we came back, he was waiting outside the door for us. So that's pretty cool because he discovered something about himself he didn't know he enjoyed, and he was really good at it. The kind of the back end or behind the scenes story is um, I emailed his father and said, you know, what did Bob tell you about what he did? Oh, yeah, he said he had fun. It was good. You know, he didn't really, you know, like your kids come home from school and you're like, how was school? Yeah, all right. What'd you do? Nothing. You know, it was like one of those kinds of conversations. But I wrote up this email to let Bob's dad know he impressed us beyond what we would have expected anyone that came that day to do and told him kind of the same stuff I told you. And his dad was like, I had no idea. He didn't mention any of this. So right there at that moment, for a parent to have a revelation or a revelation about what their, their child's interest in, and, and the kids just sometimes, you know, I think most kids are like this. They just don't tell their parents certain things that they're interested in for no reason. They just don't. And his dad was like really thrilled. And then after that, he said, you know, we're going to go to Hack for Kids Chicago. Uh, Chicago. Are you guys going to have these challenges? He really wants to do this. And are they going to be the same? So no, we're going to have new ones. And, and we're going to create some just for him. And one of the fun ones that we had was uh, a 3D printed Braille plaque that they had to like kind of go through and figure out the Braille. And uh, Orabesh, for any of the Star Wars geeks, you know what Orabesh is? We had some stuff encoded in Orabesh. So that was really cool. He had a great time. So that was Bob. Um, Bob loves crypto. Then there's Alice. And so, uh, you know, this one starts off as a sadder story. So I met Alice in Detroit last year at, at B Sides Detroit. And her parents were in IT, and she was adopted by them. And one of the things about Alice is she was brought into the world, into a home with two parents that had chemical addictions, you know, alcohol, drugs, whatever. I don't know the story behind that, but I know, they, you know, it was hard to provide as parents for that kid. So Alice didn't always go to school regularly, didn't have clothes that always fit properly, didn't always eat regularly. So certain things that some kids just expect and take for granted, Alice didn't have. She wasn't getting a proper education. She eventually wound up into the foster care system and then was adopted by, we'll just say, Alice's parents, the IT people. 
and they went to B-Sides Detroit because they wanted to go and check, check it out. And they heard that there was going to be a hack for kids. So they brought her. And it's not that Alice was like really into tech, but she was starting to show signs of interest. So her parents wanted to see where it would go. Well, um, one of the things that Alice did, and, and I would ask them, you know, I'd try to get to know the kids a bit. She never really did anything with like Lego Robotics or Mindstorm or the EV3. And we had this Sumobot competition. So we had about 12 kids there for that event. So she was the second kid to compete. So she built her bot. It wasn't exactly this one. I grabbed that off the internet. But she it was, kind of had like a wall in front of it. And what they do is the bots have to push each other out of this circle, right? And uh, you, know, you push it out, you win. You break pieces off of the other bot, you get points. Well, her bot won all the challenges thereafter. So she got first place in something she's never done before, which was a $25 gift card. So now, mind you, this is someone that had a really rough start in the world. So imagine what winning a $25 gift card meant to her. It was pretty cool, and we're very happy to do it. But then she went on and started to do some of the other challenges that we had in the CTF. She got through all the crypto. Now, one of the things is you might be thinking, how much help did she have from her mom? Well, one of the things that we do is we always tell the parents, if your kids are stuck, ask them a simple question. Do you want time or coaching? And you could do it too. Time or coaching. A lot of the times they'll say, I want some more time. And when they get coaching, it's not give them the answer. It's kind of nudge them, right? You know, you want to be that mama or papa bird that's kind of nudging the baby bird to the edge of the nest, but you don't really want to push them off until they're ready to fly. So she would kind of nudge her in the right direction, and she did really well. All the social engineering questions, not a problem. She figured those out. Lock picks, she did very well. She didn't get them all, but she did very well in that category. And then the badge contest. She was one of the only ones that figured out what the encoded message on the badge was that was scrolling by. So she was doing really well. Well, she did so well, she tied for first place in the CTF. So now, here she is. She's got a $25 gift card and then a pick of the first prize. So she got herself a Kana kit, which, if you know what that is, it's like a little Raspberry Pi starter kit. It's a great thing for somebody who's interested in this stuff to start with, because it has Scratch on there, and you can build a Minecraft server, write Python code. It's a lot of fun. So these are some case studies I wanted to share with you, to just because it's hard to know about these things unless you hear about it, right? It'd probably be a good write-up on our website, but that's, that's kind of telling you about why we need to have hacking in STEM. Some other case studies, uh, you know, we started in 2014 with 40 kids, and then in 2015, we um, educated about 115, and then in 2016, we were closer to uh, 240, and this year we're projecting that we're going to be able to like, educate about 350 kids, including today. So we had about a dozen kids there today. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to kind of go a little quicker, but um, you know, how do you engage the students? Be a mentor. And if you're a kid and you already know something, you could be a mentor too. It doesn't have to just be somebody who's in like, you know, senior in high school or, or college grad. Uh, leadership's important, right? We also have to demonstrate leadership within ourselves to show them so they know what good leadership is. Um, any kind of activities that you can think of, you know, Raspberry Pi, Pi Zeros are pretty cheap. The crypto challenges we have online on our website. So if you're struggling to come up with something fun, you can go to our website and download them. Python, and then we always have a CTF that's online. It's online right now, ctf.hackforkids.com. Anyone can, even the adults, can sign up and have some fun. Uh, every time around uh, an event, we'll then like reset it or maybe create some new challenges. I really wanted to spend some time to talk about what we did with a DEF CON 24 scholarship. Unfortunately, kind of running a little short on time. So I just want you guys to know one of the things that we did real briefly is we sent four students that were graduating high school to DEF CON. We paid for their airfare, put them in a hotel. We um, provided some food for them a little bit. And I, you know, it wasn't without the support of the community. We got money from Mozilla. Some people at Mozilla just gave us $1,000. So 
We're going to try to do another one. Maybe we'll see. Maybe next year might be better timing. But that's really good stuff. They had a great time. And then they wrote up their experiences, which I'm going to share someday. Challenges, it, it kind of comes down to the view. The public view of us is not always very positive. We need to keep it positive. Keep doing positive things. It will change. It's becoming cool to be a hacker, but not a cyber criminal. Funding, makerspace, hacking spaces, all this stuff's important. Support them any way you can. Even if you give them 10 bucks, you don't know how much that could help. And then even in the rural, rural, rural areas, there's the ruraltechfund.org for, for people who live really far away from big cities like Indianapolis that want to have this kind of education. This is a great resource. I'm going to skip these challenges just because of time. Uh, I think you folks can get it. It's hard to measure the metrics. Very difficult to report on success. I mean, who wants to answer a bunch of surveys? But sometimes we need to know how well we're doing. And, and can't emphasize this enough. It's everybody. We're all in this together, OK? So participate. Do your best to support all these different kinds of activities in order to you know, make STEM great again. So I will cut to the uh, <laughs> silliness of uh, Chris Sistrunk. And even added uh, dual core kind of growing there, wearing his DerbyCon hat. Vote for STEM. Make STEM great again. And vote for Dave and Chris in 2016. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So I try to keep with the time. Do we have time for a couple questions? OK. One question? Anybody? Take two. Any questions? All right. Oh, you do? So generally speaking, if your child's starting to show some interest in technology or if you just want to take the initiative to expose them, there are games and activities for them even as young as three. And, and you can maybe push it to two depending, again, each, you know, everybody's development. But there's a game called Robot Turtles. I bought the Kickstarter kit. It's no tech, but it teaches programming and loops and, and flow control and all that other stuff. And it's a great way for you to spend time with your kid off screens because it's card based with a board and you have to make the silly little sounds of the turtle moving and blowing up ice walls. It's required. So How, what ages do you recommend like, for Hack for Kids? So Hack for Kids, right, which is where I thought the question was going to first go, uh, 7 to 17. You know, once they're 18, kind of different mentality and state of life where they're at. But 7, we, we have it like going into third grade. Because there's a big difference between someone going into second grade versus third grade from a reading and executive functioning capabilities and their ability to kind of sit there and focus. Thanks for clarifying that. Did you have any other questions in there? Okay. Anyone else? Yes, sir. That was a part of usually what I mentioned in the presentation, and I kind of skipped it. One of the things I was going to mention was um, like Roots, which again, part of my uh, Roots Asylum was part of the inspiration. They're very Las Vegas focused, right? People go there to bring their kids to all the activities. We want to do something different where Hack for Kids goes to the kids, and that's what we've been doing. We you know, pr piloted it in Chicago, and we've been going to Indianapolis. We're doing Indianapolis twice this year. Uh, we even have an event in. Belgium, Ghent, Belgium, two years in a row. So yes, that's a part of it. As far as, as, far as we can go, the, the planet is our, our venue.